blueprint for this. Like, I don't know what we, you thought we had some magical Bible. He's like, call the guy and see what's up. So after getting chewed out from about 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. by a restaurant owner, that was like, okay, my life is different now. I'm Matthew Hopkins. I, I'm a Chicago native with about a decade of experience in risk management and fraud prevention at a different tech companies here in Chicago, and now serving as a director of risk here at Aeropay. How has the jump moving to director of risk really kind of looking back in your career, like we'll build into your story, but has this been a huge shift for you of like, you're a little bit newer to the role. So what has it been like ramping up into this new role for you? It's been, it's been really amazing. So Aeropay has been just a wonderful organization to join. Like the team is, is so amazing, but the difference is, is Aeropay is in a, in a growth phase where I've joined companies when they've kind of been further along in their risk orgs. So it's just getting some of that foundational, you know, groundwork laid that is, is kind of new to me. And so it comes with challenges, but it's been super supportive to been, be with this team. And it's been such a fantastic ride in the few months I've been there so far. What's one moment that stood out to you? Moment that's, oh, that's a good one. I'm trying to think, oh, it's when, you know, sitting uh, probably about a month into training where it's okay, this actually makes sense to me and coming in. With all my experience, I really kind of had that a moment of imposter syndrome yeah. being like, can I do this? Do I have the skills? And then it was like, oh, wait a second. Like, I am in the right place. This is really what's happening to me. And then we also had a wonderful week where we had everyone, all of our remote teams came into Chicago. And that was when I was like really reinforced with like, this is an amazing place. Now let's take it back. How did you fall into the world of fraud? And I say fall because... I think we all kind of recognize, like, I didn't set out to do this, but it found me, I found it, whatever it may be, and I stuck with it. I've only met a few people who've had the intention to get into this field from a young age. And so me, like everyone else, I had no plan. I was not the best student. I did not go to college. I ended up working in mobile marketing. So I spent like my 20s traveling the country, doing snowboarding events and skateboarding events. And, you know, my family's here in Chicago, so I moved back here and Groupon was just blowing up at that time. So I got a job as a frontline customer service agent, you know, answering phones. And then a couple months later, I'm, you know, handling, I'm managing 25 people. And one of the things with a growing company like that is there's all these funky challenges and problems that nobody had ever experienced before. And so we had a specific team called the Wolf Mothers that yeah. I was headhunted into. It was just for problem solving. And so it was, that was like day one. And my friend, Brian, who tried to bring me in, I said no. And then my mentor, Colin, really was the one to reinforce, like, you need to be on this team. You have the brain for it. Just never saying it's not my job as problems come around. How, how did that name yeah. come about? Okay, so it's, it's a combination of two things, right? It's no, it has nothing to do with the band Wolf Mother, <laughs> but it was based on Harvey Keitel's character in Pulp Fiction. So there's a scene in that movie where they need to call the wolf to solve the problem. But we, after pitching the name, the wolf, the, the, you know, the people leading it thought it was a little too harsh. So we wanted to have the mother in there because we're really there to nurture the, the other teams that we work with to make sure that we weren't, we weren't too brazen in our decisioning. So that's that marketing career background yeah i wish i could take credit for the name but it was with the team before and so yeah. i like it i've never heard anything really at least that specific around it i know uh, there was one it got rejected still this day i still was like i'm still calling this task force team this this thing uh, we we worked on a project that was a cash reconciliation sounds boring but it was all around like losses of it i was calling it the cream team for cash rules, everything around me. The people I was working with did not appreciate it to the level that I did. We wanted to call it something. I'm like, oh, there's no better name than cream. Cash rules, everything around me. This is a cash reconciliation project. Tell me there's a better name than that. Yeah, it was funny. We had someone come over from Groupon Australia 
And they replicated our team out there, but they called it the Sentinels. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is really cool that we're not only getting replicated globally, but you know, you guys had your own name over there. So yeah. This video is brought to you by Dodgeball, a fraud journey orchestration platform. Dodgeball helps fraud leaders see their entire user journey and history, get visibility into the performance of their fraud solutions, and deploy any third-party solution instantly without engineering. As you're getting used to that that new role, of you're, you're jumping in with the wolf mothers. Uh, I don't know if it was, it might have not been even this moment in itself, but we all have that meaningful moment in our career that just kind of puts a stamp on it of, Maybe it might be best, maybe it might be worst, but it was this moment that sticks with us. For you, what is that welcome to fraud moment for you, that meaningful moment that just sticks with you? I'll never forget it. And so I, I got the title of Night Wolf because I always used to work. And so I would be, you know, my team would kind of head out of the office between five and six, and I would stay online until 11 to kind of support any problems that could happen in the middle of the night. And there was just, you know, I'm a week into the job. I kind of, you know, have no clue what I'm doing. And there is an issue with a merchant who it was just a mess to, to be succinct. And I didn't know what to do. I'm like, how can I solve this problem? And I, you know, I call my boss and I'm like, Colin, what do I do? And he's like, there's no blueprint for this. Like, I don't know what we, you thought we had some magical Bible. He's like, call the guy and see what's up. So after getting chewed out from about 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. by a restaurant owner, that was like, okay, my life is different now. And we were able to actually get to the bottom and end up with a positive resolution for this one. But that was pure luck. I almost blew a million dollar deal as a result of me just not having no experience, no history. And my Colin, who was my mentor, was like, you are the personality, you are the right person to handle this. He's like, there's, there's a few of us here, but there's no guy. We're, we're figuring this out. We're creating history, literally. And that was one of the best things about that experience was to realize that I do have this talent and you have to fail and fall on your face many times. Just like your first, your first fraud loss. All of us that work in fraud have, have seen that happen, where we made a mistake. And how do you handle that mistake and, and kind of pick yourself up from it? So I was fortunate that one ended well, but it did. I was so scared in that moment. I will go on record and I've been on record before saying I hate documentation. I hate documenting, but I recognize the value of it and the purpose of it, especially in moments like this. Of There's a lot of one offs and nuances within the fraud space. So someone, a team might come to you and say, hey, what do we do if you do this? And you're like, OK, well in that scenario, is it this or is it that? And they're like, I don't know. But it starts to be the grounds of like a best known practice, a playbook, a framebook, whatever framework, not framebook, maybe framebook, I don't know, the Wolf Den's Bible, whatever it may be. Did you start to build out a process from there? Or were you, you a know, little it, bit kind of earlier in your career? We handled a lot of, a lot of different things in, in this, this really cool, fun team. And so some things we, we had to have processes for because we did handle some compliance things as well, which always kind of overlaps in our world. So some of that was well documented. But, you know, Groupon was we were selling things that had never been sold on the Internet for the first time. So when, you know, a thousand people show up for a, a fun run where that doesn't exist or, you know, the people organizing the run weren't there. And what do you do? We didn't have any anticipation for some of the problems we had in, in different gnarly situations we get into. And we kind of were like, you know, the, the, the seasoned experts were there to consult you, but a lot of it, we just never <laughs> put into playbooks. And then I remember by the time we, I, I was leaving the team, we were trying to be like, okay, if X happens, then you do this. And so it got a lot more organized by the time I was leaving there. And that was due to, you know, transitioning into the legal department to give us a lot more of that support for these insane issues that you'd never think would come up with internet coupons. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the reasons why I hate doc documentation is one is a big lift when you first do it, but it's also this maintenance project that never gets done correctly. So if I pass this down to someone else and it's so outdated, this legacy knowledge is building the foundation of like my onboarding, my career. And then am I set up for failure? Am I set up success? 
whose fault really is it in this situation? For you to get land your role where you are today at Aeropay, I'm sure you're over the last like three to five years, you needed to unlearn something to get where you are today. What is something that falls into that? You know, it, it really, it comes down to, for me, unlearn, like thinking that I know everything or thinking that I am an expert and dropping that ego has been one of the most, like the most things that helped me lead to my success, to be honest with you, because we're in an ever changing landscape and, you know, I'm, I'm a dinosaur here at 40 and I'm certain like when, you know, all these different ways and these different methods of attacks that are coming up from fraudsters. And even the the advent of, you know, people coming in with first party fraud, I never saw that earlier in my career. And I'm like, no, this guy's using his real name and we have his driver's license. He has to be completely legit. And then you sustain a loss from that user. It's like, okay, like things are changing. I don't know what's going on. And that's really kind of served me well to kind of keep that almost like childish curiosity and to say that, like, I have this foundational knowledge that I've built over a decade but treat every case as if it's completely fresh or could be a new situation that you've never experienced. A lot of people go through that similar realization when it comes to first party fraud, friendly fraud, whatever you really want to call it, argue, whatever side of, no, this is a legitimate user. And then you start to find this pattern of why are all these legitimate users now coming back, charging back to us, abusing, circumventing policies, whatever it may be, that the route that this legitimate looking user ad account creation is now playing out like that downstream the user journey. So where are the behaviors along that journey to say, can we determine will they or won't they, who is at higher risk of the population? How is that something you thought about going through that that exercise in itself? I know for me, that's always been something that's been pretty challenging. Some roles more yeah. so than others. You know, and I, honestly, it's it's interesting about different, you know, in, in different stops along my journey, there's been different levels of access that I have to to data. And I had an interesting issue at one point where we kept seeing things go turn fraudulent when we, you know, passed everything. And I was like, there, this is either the most advanced fraud ring or something, something weird is going on. And this was happening at a pretty high volume. No like risk scoring models. They're passing, they're passing absolutely everything. So I, I actually walked away from the computer, like after burning through about a hundred of these accounts and finding nothing. So I'm like, cool going on a walk, going to clear my head. And I don't know, I think I saw a piece of graffiti that was like a robot or something. And then this light bulb goes off. I'm like, this can't be human behavior. So what else do I need to look at? And so right away, I'm like, go to, go to my buddy who's an engineer. I'm like, do we log page time? Because this is that was the only thing I could think of as being a scripted attack or something like that. So he's like, oh, yeah, I, like I could show you all the Splunk logs and all this. And I didn't need, I didn't even honestly know what Splunk was. I am not like a technical yeah. guru on that. And so right away we're able to see they're blazing through a checkout page that typically takes about 45 seconds to over a minute in 10 seconds. So we're like everything that is under 30 seconds on this one page, put it in a bucket and boom, we solve the problem. And then we, in that cohort, I, saw, I was fortunate enough to get confirmation because they lapsed on their VPN or whatever. And then right away, I see an IP that's coming from out of the country from a known fraud hotbed. So it was like, cool, confirmed. And if I would have stayed in that data and banging my head against the desk for another hour, I would have never thought of that. So it was really the takeaway is that there are these other data points that we may not think is risky that if you are not finding what's wrong is like open your brain up go on a walk and then come back and try and think of things from a different perspective because at the end of the day there's there's going to be that aha moment when you look at fraudulent accounts and you see something that you may have not expected and that's happening more and more and more as things get more advanced in our in our space these days yep having accessible data is huge having the visibility into the different aspects of it of like what what the data actually means is really where the 
brings the value to. But in your situation, like you had the connection. If you went to another engineer, they probably would have said, no, talk to my boss or I don't want to deal with that. You fortunately have a relationship there. That can go a lot different. I'm sure other stuff along the way has also gone different where you're like, I think I need this data point. I'm unsure. It could lead to this. It could also not do anything, but I know I don't have a data point and I know I'm stuck here. Like, how do you go about getting this support and buying and influence in a situation that you're like, I do need more data. What I have isn't sufficient and what I think I need isn't accessible. So this is, this is something that I think in, is really important for all of us who are leaders in the fraud space and especially for people starting out is that we can't think of ourselves as siloed as, you know, risk or fraud or, or compliance or anything like that. We really have to also be salespeople and marketing people, but internally we need to market and sell ourselves across the company. So one, one of the like Groupon, a lot of Groupon's activities were social. There was a tiki bar inside the building. And so it was like, you find out where do the people that have access to that information what are they doing after work? Invite yourself along. Be brazen. Be fearless. Ask those questions. But you don't. You can always be soft about it. I never. I never find that going with like a harsh approach of like I need this data today. That's not going to get you anywhere. Being like, what would it take for us to look into access to this? Can we start logging this in the tables? Who do I need to talk to? Who can I make my case for? Because you can't always put it like, in in, in it's one of those things where. You need to kind of display now in, in this, everything is needs to have a backup and people don't operate off of vibes like they used to, I found. <laughs> so you have to make it for, it's, I know it's kind of like back in the day, you'd be like, I think something's wrong here. And people would just jump on your issue and be like, that sounds fun. But I found that people who work in other, you know, cross-functional cross -functional collaborators are massively interested in fraud. And this is something I got to give props to like, the banks and the media for putting more attention to fraud than there, there used to be. So people are fascinated by it. The other day, a product manager was like, I could never do what you do. I was like, why would you do anything else? This is the most fun. Like we get to be investigators. We get to catch criminals, but you sell what we're doing to people and get them to understand the passion we have behind it. And then they will gladly put in some extra hours to say, hey, yeah, you know what? We can grab this data for you. Or you know what? And it turns out we've already been paying for access to this data. We just haven't been logging it properly. So we're now going to add it to our next sprint to make sure it's surfaced in your portal so you don't have to run queries to find it. You know, I think that's a huge piece. I've always said of like marketing data has been a huge component of segmenting different risk journeys for me. And it's like data we're already paying for, data we're already paying a lot for more often than not. Why can't I have access to it? And some companies, it's like, yeah, you can have access to it. And some companies are like, yeah, throw that on the roadmap. That doesn't seem super valuable, but whatever, you do what you want. And then it just dies on the roadmap. That's always been a challenge for me. So be, being able to, you know, I'm also comparing kind of two different spots in my journey. Well, one where I hit more roadblocks, I'm more first time going through a lot of these conversations. So I don't really know how to navigate. I don't really know like who to ask. Where later it was like, oh, I, I know who to ask. I know who to go to. I know who would really support me on this or who would also get value out of this. So it's a win-win situation. So sometimes when I tell my stories, I blend two different moments to it. And it's like, you've changed a lot within a month. And it's like, well, that's a story where I struggled. I learned a lot. And here's where I executed more from my learnings. Um, before we go today, do you have any last minute advice to the fraud community that you can take away from your own learnings in your career? Yeah, honestly, go, calling back to what I said earlier, nothing is not your job. You have to think very holistically. So like think, think you about your sales team, your product managers, what are their goals? How can you better serve them to protect them? Think like a founder. Think that every lost dollar is a dollar that is going into your own company. And honestly, we also, as fraud fighters, as a community, we need to figure out ways to better support law enforcement. Like we, we are seeing this rampant first party fraud, friendly fraud, all this. 
because the methods of people, you know, charging back things or that they're being shared. It's very well known at this point. And we need to have better consequences built for fraudsters. And we need to be, find a way to support law enforcement to actually create those consequences. And it seems very well known amongst fraudsters that they're not going to get in trouble for what they're doing. And we need to push for change in that format. I appreciate you coming on today, Matthew, and sharing your stories and tactics and advice with our audience. How can they get a hold of you to learn more from you? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Matthew Hopkins. Uh, you can find me through the AeroPay page. So it's been a pleasure, Brian. Really appreciate you having me on.